The Bank of France is warning that these protests are dragging down an already slightly faltering economy. I mean, just how damaging is this pro protest movement being uh, thus far? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, to me, it's hugely damaging. The time of year that we're talking about, the season that uh, we're currently in, for many retailers and many businesses will be the time of year when they make the bulk of their revenue. Many uh, retail outlets like those that are boarded up today on the Champs-Élysées, this would be one of the busiest Saturdays of the year and one of the real kind of money spinners that would ensure their survival for the rest of the year. And that's, and that, and that we're talking about the retail sector, but also we could talk about tourism, transport, and also the more, I think, more diffuse sense of the image of France as a secure place to book a holiday. I mean, this is huge. France relies massively on tourism. It's one of the most visited countries in the world. And when you put these protests together with sort of the current episodes of, of jihadist violence, I mean, it, you know, it's not looking good. It's looking to me as if it's costing France quite a lot of money at a time when, really, it can ill afford it. Indeed, and some people might say that, you know, President Emmanuel Macron has already made concessions uh, to the tune of around 10 billion euros to these protesters. Uh, some might ask, you know, why are they still so angry? Uh, I just want to ask you, I mean, are those concessions, in your view, going to make any sort of meaningful difference, do you think? Well, I think, to be honest, um, they have, because we can see that, you know, what Mélenchon was calling for, uh, an escalation into this weekend's Act 5 of, of, of the sort of Gilets Jeunes crisis, it hasn't materialised. We can see that the numbers have massively dropped. However, this, there's still going to be a, a significant chunk of these of these protesters, a little bit like, you know, the, the sort of Brexiteers in the UK or, or, or those that support Trump in the US, who will not be content with any concessions. Their, their issue is one with, this, with, with the idea of a sort of elite establishment that's out of touch. For them... You know, it, it, the, the entire sort of social and political system needs to be swept aside in a much more profound way to make them happy. Luckily, as with the UK and the US in France, these voices are very much part of the minority, but are still going to remain a sort of a troublesome feature of minor strikes and blockades, I think, across the country. Um, just lastly, I mean, I want to talk to you a little bit about cost of living, which is a, a major gripe amongst the protesters who are taking to the streets. I mean, people have always said Paris is expensive, and then ever since the introduction of the euro, uh, right across the eurozone, there have been some countries that say that they uh, did rather badly out of the conversion from, uh, in France's case, francs to euros, and that's made, uh, you know, passed a huge cost on to consumers. I mean, how justified is uh, that anger at the cost of living, and has it got worse or markedly uh, more pronounced? do you think, in, in, in recent months and years? I, mean, I think there's two things here when we talk about the cost of living in, in advanced democracies. One is, it is expensive. I mean, there's no, there's no way of getting around that. I mean, you only need to go into a Monoprix anywhere in France or into a cafe in Paris and pay, you know, four euros for a cafe au lait to realise, you know, France is expensive and particularly Paris is very expensive. However, a lot of these people that are protesting come from areas that we would consider actually not expensive. So parts of rural France or places in France where the cost of living is actually on a euro for an advanced Western European country are actually quite cheap. What I think a lot of these protests are about is a bit like the notion of the American dream in that people expect year on year for the standard of living to constantly increase. Right? That, that's the sort of main thrust of the ideology of, sort of late capitalism, that things will always get better. People will be able to afford bigger cars and nicer holidays and more consumer goods. What these people actually are, are realising is that might not actually be the case. And with growing inequality, you can see the erosion of the sort of privileges of the upper working, sort of lower middle classes. But people's standard of living, they're not starving per se, but their standard of living are not meeting expectations. Their disposable income is not meeting the expectations that they, that, that they sort of expect. The problem with that is, we've got two questions. One is, can the government address that? And B, should a government seek to address that, right? Okay. I mean, it very much depends on your ideological persuasion, but one could put, put across an argument that these kinds of more, less sort of life mm. and death um, issues aren't really one for a government to address. Okay. 